Welcome to the 100th episode of Witchlet. I'm your host, Victoria Rashke, author, publisher, witch, and nosy Scorpio. 100 episodes. I was told early on you weren't a real podcast until you had six episodes. And here we are. Thank you to all the wonderful authors who've come on to share their experience and wisdom. Thank you to all the PR folks who sent those authors my way. Thank you for trusting in our niche within a niche endeavor. Thank you to my partner, Kaifel, for supporting this from the get-go and handling all the technical stuff, because I really don't shine at that part. Thank you to my son, Julian, for editing episodes. His lovely wife, Sue, for checking transcripts. Our dear friend, Alexander, for the outro music. And most importantly, thank all of you for listening and commenting and reviewing and following us on social media. A podcast can't be sustained in a vacuum and we wouldn't be here without you. So here's to 100 more episodes of Witchlet. Witchlit is brought to you by Thousand Volt Press, a family-owned independent publisher established to produce the books we want to see in the world. Titles including Changing Past by Yvonne Aborough, Pondering the Commonplace by Lane Fuller and Corey Thomas Hutchison, and my latest book, Verona Green, can be purchased directly from thousandvoltpress.com or wherever you buy books. Erica Buenaflor has a master's degree in religious studies with a focus on Mesoamerican shamanism from the University of California, Riverside. A practicing curandera for more than 20 years, descended from a long line of grandmother curanderas, she has studied with curanderex in Mexico, Peru, and Los Angeles, and gives presentations on curanderismo in many settings. The author of several books, including Cleansing Rites of the Curanderismo, and her most recent book, Veneration Rites of the Curanderismo. Erica Buenaflor, welcome to Witchlet. Yeah, thank you for having me. I'm super excited about this. I am super excited to have you on. I've thoroughly enjoyed your book and I can't wait to talk to you about it and about writing. But our first question for everyone on the show is, you know, especially in this kind of age of visual medium and social media and all that, why still write? Why still write books? (laughs) It's a passion. It's a passion. And I feel that it's people need resources. People need resources because I mean, there's some of us that we like, it's like my books are like manuals, you know, provides the resources and it's like the, how to do the rights, how to do Olympia rights, how to do the veneration rights. It's like the steps, the information, the history. It's, you know, we need that still. Mm-hmm. We still need that. And like, and it's, and it's compact in one resource in one source where you can find everything in one little, like beautiful nugget. I like that. I like that. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, though we do get information from those other media, I think being able to sit with a book is still so different. Yes. Yes. It, yeah. Yeah. It's it's actually, yeah, it's, it's a part of like, and getting to know ourselves because we can connect into it. When mm-hmm. we like are able to like sit and read for a f- couple hours, a few hours, we can just let ourselves really get enmeshed in mm-hmm. whatever it is that we're doing and we're reading rather than we just getting little snippets um, cause then it's just fast. It's like very, very fast. And we don't really get to digest what we are mm-hmm. learning and what we are reading. Uh, so your new book, do you want to tell us the title and, and what it's about and why this book now? So a veneration writes of curanderismo, invoking the center, sacred energy of our ancestors. So why now? I feel right now it's, it's something that it's, it's very beautiful. Of, of allowing ourselves to connect and identify ourselves with our answers in terms of our identity and, and working with our ancestors for magic, for connecting healing, for different purposes and making our lives more amazing and just to feel rooted and grounded in whatever identities that we're being rooted and grounded in. Because there's a lot of us like, you know, back in, you know, back way back in the eighties, when I first came to the States, it was very much like expected like this melting pot. Like you didn't have like you, you were, you didn't carry your, your, your traditions. You didn't have those cultural traditions. You were just expected to just like melt in and be a part of the pot. And now it's like a lot of us were asking like, wait a second, I want to know about my, you know, whether it's Mexican, whether it's Irish, whether it's African, whether it's what, you know, our, 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 we're we're hungry for that because it's part of our identity. It's part of 
who we are and giving people practical tools to do that and beautiful tools in many different ways that feel aligned with us. So it just, it just seemed like it's the flow of the time right now. Um, and so this is not your first book. It's my oh, fifth book. It's your fifth book, right? So I, I, from reading this one, I have not read your other books, but from reading this one, it's clear to me that this is like a succession of a conversation you're having in your work. Like that each of these kind of build on the previous one. So do you want to kind of talk about like your publishing journey and how you got started and like where, where you're going with it, I guess. Sure. So this is my last book. Um, so it's, it's technically it's six books because I have a guidebook for my mm-hmm. Mesoamerican Orca card deck. So my, my first book was really reintroducing cleansing. Clean, it's called cleansing rites of curanderismo mm-hmm. and it's reintroducing curanderismo. Um, cause when I, when I now, you know, especially in a lot of the Latinx communities, like curanderismo, a lot of people are talking about it. People are talking about limpias and platicas. When I first started talking about it, nobody was like, what are limpias? Oh yeah, that was something my grandmother did. And I don't remember. It was like, it was, it was something that like was almost getting forgotten about, mm-hmm. you know? Um, and it was something that my great, great grandmother was a very well-known curandera and my great grandmother, she, she healed with like cooking and my grandmother went the restaurant. So Western route in terms of becoming a nurse. So our traditions were kind of getting like lost. So it was in a sense of, and, and there was this whole like, um, thinking of like, well, curanderismo, we don't know if it really came from the Spaniards or the indigenous. We don't know. It's just a mix of everything. And I was like, wait, wait a second, wait a second. No, we still have the codices. We still have the artwork. We still have a lot of information that we can root, you know, these traditions in our indigenous ancestors and, you know, understand where they're coming, from, especially the fundamentals and see them. So that was my first book, inter- reintroducing it and tracing the history back to our indigenous ancestors. Mm. So it was, and, and my my books are really our, our bridge. They're a bridge because it's reclaiming a lot of our erased histories. Because there was this whole, like, especially even in academia, there was still this thing of like, oh, we don't know where these, they may come from Spanish. It may be a Spanish tradition. There were a few academics that were like, no, wait a second. This, this understanding, especially like Solas, it comes from indigenous. You can find it in this history. You like they were more. It takes mm-hmm. work. It, it's you know. So that's what. But my books were very much intended for mainstream audiences too, because it's like because I mean yeah we have this information in academia, but even in academia it's um it's not like it's not really nourished for the soul. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> it's very like dry, like eating like crackers sometimes. <laughs> You know, so it's not, it's not as fun. So I really was like bringing like bridging worlds with my first book, Cleansing Mm -hmm. Rats of Curanderismo. And then my second book was something that I was seeing a lot of is our our soul loss. It's called Curanderismo Soul Retrieval. Because it's a tradition of understanding that when we have wounds, when we have traumas, parts of us leave into what are known as the spirit realms, non-ordinary realms, right? And they're not going there to relive the trauma. They're going there to get the medicine that they didn't get from us. Mm-hmm. You know, so we also have something to learn from those soul pieces too. Like, for example, if maybe someone didn't, had like a falling out with their 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 father, they didn't have a good, their mother, daughter, their mother and father didn't have a good relationship. They got a divorce and maybe their father was out of the picture and there was some trauma around that. In this other realm, they may be in this other realm getting the medicine that they didn't get from their father. You know, mm-hmm. and and they haven't stepped into that for themselves. So, my second book talks a lot about these understandings of how how we get nourished with the cardinal spaces because there's medicine in there. How we open up these realms, these spirit realms, to reconnect and welcome back these soul pieces while we're getting what's known as tonali, soul energy. Mm-hmm. That's that's what we're welcoming back. So it's this beautiful like understanding of like under, bringing in these weaving in these indigenous understanding of soul loss which is known as susto and using it in practical ways that are very meaningful to us that anyone can use and access, have access to. Right. Um, so that was the second book. And then the third book was working with the sacred energies of the sun and moon. Cause we were, I mean, a lot of us, we were sun people. Mm-hmm. We, I mean, we, we loved and we, some of us were moon, you know, but we love the sun. We love the sun, the moon and understanding how to work with the because it's believed that the sun, along with the cardinal spaces, they give out tonali, soul energy. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. They nur- that, that that nourishes us, gives us energy, gives us strength, revitalizes us. And there's certain times of the day that we can access and work magic with, limpia rites with, that we can work and integrate to make our life more magical too. Mm-hmm. And and I feel that that's really important because a lot of us we've lost that um, that that understanding of like working with the elements and and the mon- the moon and the sun is a big one you know and 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 understanding the flow of that and understanding the en- specific energies that we're believed to let out at certain times of the day so i, I talk about that and i also integrate it with limpia rites too cleansing rites you know that that we can work you know to heal to to work magic to man all all these different things right and i i bring in i weave in stories that i've worked with people and then my fourth book is animal medicine and it weaves in also the tradition of shape shifting because that's also really rooted in Mexico, like it in, in Guatemala and different countries in um, in in the Americas. Actually, it's not just it's Native American too. Like we have different understandings of shape shifting and also connecting with animal guides, animal medicine. Mm-hmm. So it's like broken up to, to understanding how we connect because sometimes we need to get primal. Sometimes we need to connect with an animal and get that medicine and have it flowing with us and working with us. And also the understandings of how did the, how did my ancestors view the medicines that different animals have, the, the, the animals that are discussed in the medicine. So it's a two part. That's when it's discussed of how to connect with animal guides. And then the sex, the second part is 76 animals that are discussed and the animals they had the views and how to work with them. And, um, and then the next one, the fifth one is my guidebook for the Mesoamerican Orca cards. And it, it's like a 96 page guidebook that tells you about the different Oracle, the, the day signs, because mm-hmm. um, we worked with divination a lot and how we manifest and understanding the different meanings that every day had. Um, so I, this little guidebook that tells you about, you know, how to work with them, what to expect. And it's also contemporary understandings. And then my last book, this will be my last book. <laughs> You're done. This that. is it. <laughs> I'm done is this book, Veneration Rites Curanderismo, working mm-hmm. with our ancestors. Mm-hmm. So it's it's weaving in, um, and it's it's bringing in limpia rites to work with our ancestors, bringing in veneration rites to connect and to help heal us and our family and our lineages and empower us in different ways. Mm-hmm. It's so interesting because just having you kind of lay out that arc of those books, like you really see now I, I really see even more that like this is really like a culmination in a lot of ways of that of that arc which is fascinating and I, one of the things i loved your book and i think i underlined it to you i marked the page that um you know in order to have these conversations about like reclaimed practices that you really have to bring the personal experience and academic together that you have to those conversations have to happen and i thought it was just a really interesting way to put it that you know, because so much was lost, like before the native peoples of, you know, what, what is now Mexico and Central America and North America in general, and even for settlers and colonial people who came, like so much of their indigenous practices were lost too, that like, there's no way to have this unbroken line. So how do we get, how do we get there? Yeah. uh, Is that, yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's, and that's what I say is like weaving in those because I, I I talk about very vulnerable sites mm-hmm. of decolonization because that's that's you know bringing that in and mm-hmm. and reclaiming ourselves. It's like saying okay, this is um, reclaiming our agency because that's essentially what it is, and that's how I define decolonization mm-hmm. is reclaiming our agency for identity and bringing in the like the, the spiritual practices of our ancestors and then like bring it into our day-to-day life and having it make sense to us. Mm-hmm. So all those, bringing all those conversations into dialogue with one another, it's very important. Mm-hmm. Did you find when you were doing research for your books and just like in your own academic studies, I, I, I can't imagine, I mean, I can, but I don't know that it's a good imagining necessarily of coming across these things and like, having those aha moments in in a very spiritual way about what you're learning in a context that's not really for that. Like, what was that like? Like just doing that research and kind of having those aha moments about your own personal practice and knowing in this context of academia, I guess. 
Well, I think it's it's one of those things that, you know, when I when I went back to school, when I went back to school, I was I was already older. You know, I wasn't a young buck. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, so I was I was 36, I believe. Yeah, I was 36. And I mean, that's not like super old, but, you know, it's, I wasn't like in my 20s. Right. So I was able to go. I, I would go there with like literally like a little, you know, the, the, the little pulley carts that you have. I would literally fill it up with books. And I mean that I knew what what I was there because I wanted access to the information that I couldn't get on on Amazon. I wanted access to like libraries that I could, I know I could like order books like for free, you know, they can send them. And I just had to just place an order at the library. And I wanted access to that. Mm -hmm. Um, And I, I was very clear about that. So I was able to like do it in the privacy of my my own house, you know, when I was reading things and I'd be crying and I'd be writing about it. And so I was able to gift myself that mm-hmm. I was able to gift myself that. And, um, you know, and then when I got to academia, it was, it was, it was a little bit of a, like a shift, you know, cause they were looking at it more from like, okay, how do we study these people? And I was seeing myself as these people. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's the big difference, right? <laughs> so there wasn't that disconnection when it was like how they were studying it was like studying it like from a, like a, a like a you know um some like an outside view and I was like mm-hmm. well I am this person right. and that, that also that also informed me like I didn't want to continue um moving forward in academia that that was I wasn't didn't want to be a professor I didn't I, 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 that wasn't me mm-hmm. that wasn't me I mean I'm grateful for all the academics that do the research and so grateful for that, but I just didn't want to go that route, you know, so that, that was like, okay, yeah, no, that's not for me. (laughs) Mm -hmm. No, that makes sense. So in your, like within your practice and like your, in your writing and the books, like how does all that mesh together for you? Like what, what purpose do the books serve for you like in your own practice and in the work that you do with others? So a lot, like, for example, um, and this is something that, that was very like recent, like I was, I was teaching people New Year's rights, you know, and and this could be like anyone because everyone has different, you know, a lot of people have different belief of what is a new, like, when does New Year start? Right. You know, for a lot of us Westerners, we adhere to like the first of January. That's the new year. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's different dates, you know, the Chinese, they have different dates. And um, so what I, what I do is I look at various, you know, and, and I also ask questions too, from my ancestors, from my, my family and my mentors that I worked with too, because I had four principal mentors and my mentors were, you know, I can, I connected with them in the Yucatan and the Yucatan, something about the Yucatan is that it held on to its indigenous practices, like really more than any other place in, in Mexico, maybe Oaxaca, but not like Yucatan, like they're very proud of like being able to speak the indigenous languages mm-hmm. um, and, and passing on the stories and keeping those traditions um, so I was, my, my, my principal, four principal mentors were very much rooted in those histories. So they also inform me as to what this were. So what I do is I get a collection of their stories, what's been written about like ethno histories. And I look at it like, okay, what are the similarities? So for example, for the new year, one of the things that I, I realized, and it's still done to this day is what a lot of folks do is they clean their house and they usually clean it. They put it with like, they infuse it with either um, orange or lemon blossoms or lemongrass tea or Florida water, you know, a different like concentration of tea. And I have a recipe too in Veneration Rites mm-hmm. of Curanderismo to cleanse, right? So they first clean it, but they, they the cleaner that they use, they infuse it with, with um, a cleansing solution, you know, something that cleanses the energy of the space. So they cleanse it first. And then afterwards, they, they cleanse it, continue cleansing the space with smoke, which is known in Spanish as a sahumedio. That's a charcoal tablet. It can have different resins. They have different plants. And they go around in the four corners of every room and they spread the smoke everywhere. And that, that cleanses it, right? And then they go and they, they clean out stuff. They clean out stuff that had the energy of the prior cycle or the prior year. And that could be a lot of, a lot of families, what they do, especially in the Yucatan is they, they, um, they, they get rid or they, they, they put it, they, they put shards, they put it in this ancestral shrine mm-hmm. and, um, what they used to make mice, maize, um, corn, 
you know, for the family. So a you cooking utensil cooking where that they feed the family or they maybe dishes and they put it there and that's what that's that's what they get rid of, right? And they get a new a new one for the year for a new cycle. So it's some and there's different ofrendas offerings, right, for that new cycle. So it's something that nourishes the family. It's something that nourishes the new year. It's something that's it's it's an offering and it's also what's known in it's it's a bawatsli. It's a right. It's a part of what we use to nourish our family, ourselves. It can also be a feather fan. Mm-hmm. So we get something, an offering for that year, an offering, and then on the day, on the start of that new year, we light a fire. This can be a candle. This could be a white fire limpia, but it's a fire that brings to life that new year. And all of the stories that I looked at, they all have that pattern. So that's what I look at. I look at like so many different stories and I say, what are the common elements to reclaim something? What do they look at? How are they seeing? How, how are they seeing an ofrenda for the new year? What are the meanings behind that? And so it's like taking that in and like making sure that we keep those traditions alive. Mm-hmm. I love, I love the kind of description of that. And it made me think about one of the things in your book that really stood out to me is this idea of because we don't have um, like an unbroken practice with all of the pieces that there is this kind of combination of like other things that came obviously through colonization, Christianity and and all of those that to kind of like people have filled in the gaps with those. And you use a ter- Nepantla, is that right? The, yes. This kind of blended, blended practice. And I think that's probably what people see from the outside, I think. Yes, it's, it's, Nepal is known as the liminal space. Mm-hmm. It's ambiguous, right? Because it's, it's not, it's in, in between space. And it's, it's a space that was very much recognized in indigenous. It was, there was always an in between space. Everything was always in flux and changing. There was mm-hmm. liminality, whereas Westerners, we want so much to be like, oh no, that's just a ritual. That's not, that's, you know, change is something that happens maybe in certain spots, but change is a constant. Liminal spaces are a constant and that's what it is. It's like to reclaim that, like we have to like really immerse ourselves and be okay with like surfing those waves of the unknown, the unknown Mm -hmm. and reclaiming it and like being okay. Like you're going to be thrown into a lot of questions where like everything that you thought you were, you're going to possibly (laughs) re-question. Yeah. Well, and I think for me, one of the things I thought was really beautiful about how you describe that in the book is that to me, it's a difference between a living tradition and like you said, this ritual that's kind of trapped in the past that doesn't change and grow. And like, if, if we had been lucky enough, you know, without all of the horrible things that happened to have this unbroken line, it wouldn't be what it was, you know, 400 years ago. Because modern people would have adapted and changed just like, you know, if you look at rights in the Catholic church, those have adapted and changed and the Pope can change his mind about stuff, you know? So it's, you know, that, that any kind of indigenous practice would have remained, you know, exactly the same. Doesn't make sense contextually no, either. Well, and also too, cause there's a lot of different traumas that we have now. Mm-hmm. A lot of, and so, and like on every level, on every level, the, the traumas that we have now are even what we eat, what mm-hmm. we're exposed to, that the pollution that we have, you know, what we don't and what we don't eat. And also, you know, the traumas that we have in terms of our families, who we are, what we don't have, because things change. So, but there's some underlying, you know, underlying like that, that, that weaves it too, that mm-hmm. we're still using the understanding of working with the elements and that fire transmutes water helps a rebirth. So, and, and understanding it that way, like, you know, like for example, the right that I gave of like using the fire, the mm-hmm. fire kindles a new year and brings it life, but it's going to be different of, yeah. What was it? A new, the new year cycle for them was different because some are, you know, of course it's, it's very different. It's not necessarily 365 days. It's, you know, <laughs> right. So it's going to be different in that way, but 
what the elements and like, what, where do we find those nuggets of, you know, underlying, like undergirding, like that keep those residuals that we can look at that and say, okay, what did that mean? And how do we connect with it? But how do we use it in a way that makes sense to us today? Mm -hmm. Cause it's yeah. going to be different. Yeah. Yeah. And I, mean, I just, I think that's such an interesting conversation to have. And I, I, I want people to hear that. Cause I just think it's important to, to think about like, you know, I, I just, I, part of what writing does is set things down, but that doesn't mean that it stays that way forever. Yeah. Yeah, no, it, 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 it is. It's, it's keeping records, mm -hmm. keeping records. And I, I'm fairly sure that like, I've been a record keeper for many lives yeah. <laughs> just because I love history. I love researching it. I'm one of those people that like, and I, I feel like that's always been a passion of mine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it I'm convinced things. I was a scribe yeah. in a previous life. Yeah. At least one. At least once I think I was a scribe. Um <laughs> <laughs> one of the things I wanted to ask you about, um, because I had we were, we were one of the first folks on the show to to talk about Corinturismo, is kind of like the like the public representation of it, I guess like in media, like because I feel like we have gotten in the last few years a lot more representation of um latinx practice and spirituality in you know like movies and television shows and i, I think one of the things the one of the conversations that i've heard people have is kind of this difference between what curanturismo is versus burjaria and how how those are looked at outside the culture and inside the culture do you do you feel comfortable talking about that absolutely so, okay. One of the things it's, it's, I'm just, just to like share like a couple of things. Mm -hmm. So when the Spaniards um, came here, there were thousands of different kinds of specialties, you know, in terms of like healing magic and, and, you know, shape shifting all these different things. So thousands of different kinds of names, but when the Spaniards came, they like pretty much like reduced it to like three. You were, if they didn't like you, you were a brujo or a bruja. And you mm -hmm. practice brujeria, you know, or possibly a sort that they really didn't like you. You were a sorceress. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if they liked you, you were a curandera, curandero, you know, and, and it's, it's, it wasn't necessarily just about that they were doing healing work. It's a type of, or, or that they were, you know, if they were, they were shapeshifters, they were, oh, you're a sorcerer. It wasn't the type of work you were doing. It was whether they liked you or they didn't. Yeah. You know, I give one example too, in my, my fourth book, Animal Medicine, there was a, a healer that came in that used to be able to, when he would heal, he would shapeshift into his animal guides, right? And um, it was a story that the wife, you know, had this one curandero, like he was, he was healing, she, he was healing her husband. And um, when he came out, he had, a, he had, he was shapeshifted into a dog. So the wife is hitting the 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 dog, you know, <laughs> and the, the curandero comes back. It's like, why were you hitting me? <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to heal your husband, you know, <laughs> but it's interesting because this story is written by a missionary mm -hmm. who is identifying the shapeshifter as a curandero, not as a sorcerer, not as a shaman, because it's like, oh, okay, we like him. We liked mm -hmm. him. So now he's a curandero. So what's it, it had nothing to do with this. So there's that there's yeah. element that, and that, that, that can never be like, there's elements of that and what that is, mm -hmm. you know, that has woven into like, the different understandings to it, even in the Yucatan too, in the Yucatan too, like where I was at, it's like seeing who, you know, cause I, I asked, you know, cause I was, I was, I wanted to like talk to different Kodandereks and I, I had like other people ask me, like, ask them like, oh, can you set up something so I can talk with them and interview them and whatnot. And they would tell me a couple of them like, well, they practice Kodandereismo, but you don't want to work with them because they do a lot of Bujeria and it's not the good kind. You know, so it, it, it's, and he, but, but, you know, the essence of curanderismo, it always involves magic. It really does. Because mm -hmm. curanderismo is a culmination of oh, like hundreds of different practices that involve, those, not thousands, it's not even hundreds, no, it's thousands. Mm -hmm. Divination work, it involved um, different kinds of magic, you know, brujeria. Um, it, and it could involve something that was malicious too. Because even that indication of in the Yucatan, when they, they would say, oh, he's a curandero, but he does bad magic too. Mm -hmm. So it didn't necessarily mean that, you know, 
that because it's the, so the, the lines of distinction are blurry in different places is my point. Yeah. And, and that, that, that totally from, makes sense to me. Yeah. Yeah. And it comes from a lot from that Spanish. They liked you. You were a curandera, mm-hmm. curandero. They didn't. You were a brujo. And if they really didn't like you, you were a sorcerer. <laughs> well, and it's interesting too. I think like whether or not it's been, you know, benevolent or malicious is also partly perspective. Like if you're working for you to get the job, you're actively working for someone else not to get it. <laughs> at the same time i mean it's the same you know possibly so, yeah possibly. so i you know the perspective i i think that that is such a helpful explanation and makes way more sense to me that really it, those terms in some ways are an imposition on the practice from oh, from outside the culture which i was not aware of so that's excellent to know and i feel like i have a new wrinkle in my brain <laughs> Well, it was, it was, I mean, that was a really good example when I asked them too. It's like, oh, can you set up? Cause I wanted to talk to different, because mm-hmm. I wanted to continue, you know, like getting the history and like those practices and, and, I, and also getting my own knowledge too, and mm-hmm. sharing it and documenting it. But, you know, hearing from a lot, like, oh, but you don't want to talk to them. They do a lot of bad, bad magic, <laughs> but nonetheless, they were curanderos or curanderas. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but that's also different too. Like in different parts of Mexico, they would be a yerbero that would work with plants, but they're healing. That like it's it's just who you're talking to and where, but the connotations could change. So it's always good to ask people, "What do you mean by that?" Mm, yeah, yeah. <laughs> in so many ways, it's always good to ask people, "What do you mean by that?" <laughs> it's a good practice across the board, I think. Yeah. Oh. So I guess one of the other questions I wanted to ask you, and this may be, I don't know. I um, I mean, I always ask people like who they see their audience as, you know, when they're writing. But I think, you know, as a, a white person, you know, as a European descent white person, like reading about Kondurismo or, you know, hoodoo or conjure, like all of these different practices that have seeped in or were stolen, you know, let's be honest, by, you know, settlers and, and, and people who came as, um, colonizers, what, you know, uh, like, I feel like it's important to read about these practices. I always feel like it's important for me to do them. Like, that's not, you know, that's a whole different kettle of fish, but I feel like, you know, supporting authors who are writing about this and reading about it and knowledge are important, but as, as the, you know, as the author of these books, like, who do you see your audiences and who do you see benefiting, I guess, from the work that you're doing? Well, I mean, I, I feel like a big part of the audience are, are BIPOC folks, mm-hmm. a big part of it. I mean, I'll just be honest. Yeah. It's, it's, it's good on the dismo. That's who's going to like, oh, I remember this. Yeah. Um, Cause I do say it's, it's not just for us and it is for us. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and at the same time, it's also meant for everybody too. Cause and like a lot of, a lot of what can be used in terms of, you know, going within the heart and like getting pictures, like the very practical step by step can be used for anyone that wants to reconnect with like maybe an Irish or Norwegian or someone, you know, different or Arabic or you name it, Mm -hmm. you know, with their, you know, different, different traditions that can be used, like these different steps to connect to an ancestor. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of us, we, we have lost we have been, we have been, um, the agency of who we are and reclaiming it. We're now like, Oh, what is that again? What, it, who, who am I like? Oh, mm-hmm. let, let me, let me go figure that out. Like we're asking those questions. So I, I feel that it could be used for anyone. And I feel like mm-hmm. a big core of it is, is BIPOC. Right. Uh, and I, I feel like, you know, it, at least in like the United States, like in this and, you know, North America and, and largely, but there is such a multicultural experience for most people, like even people who come like you did as an immigrant, as a child, like you said, you came into this culture that you were supposed to be a melting pot, right? You needed to learn how to speak English. You went to school and you ate the same peanut butter and jelly sandwiches that all the other kids ate, you know, like it, that was the, the vision or whatever. Um, but that isn't how we live. Like you're right. That's not how we live at home. Like, you know, if you come as an immigrant family, you will continue some of those food ways and cult and rituals and all of those things, but you still have this multicultural experience as an American, I guess. 
depending on our, our a U.S. citizen, that American is kind of brought, I guess, in that context. <laughs> but it's um, I don't know. It's it's fascinating to me, and I've talked to other people via Hedera on the show about kind of this, you know, multicultural experience and what that means. And um, I think you know that con- that conversation with the conversation about appropriation and appreciation and how all that goes together. Like, do you think about that, like in terms of like who you work with and kind of how you share information? So one of the things that, um, and I, and I distinguish that too, and and something very important, culture, the the development of cultures, welcome to appropriation. Yeah. Yeah. Welcome to appropriation. Mm -hmm. Any culture, any culture, any culture, you know, even in indigenous, and I had a story of that, the Mexica. There was appropriation there with the Tehuacan, the Toltecs. They were they came in as as foreigners. Then there is misappropriation, the taking of the, and I, I define those things too. Mm-hmm. Then there's reappropriation, the mis- misappropriation being the taking of you know usually BIPOC our our histories um, without any kind of recognition, you know just the stealing mm-hmm. essentially the stealing of that right yeah. or just disregard of who we are. And then there's a reappropriation, which is very much what has been happening. It happened a lot too early, like 1990, 2000, 2010, with a lot of indigenous folks that were reappropriating their identities and telling you, okay, we're going to tell you what these things are. You've Mm -hmm. been putting labels on us. We're going to take that label, but we're going to tell you what that means. (laughs) So there needs to be that understanding that that's, that is because what I have seen is that a lot of folks who have been scared to, for different reasons, like scared about like, oh, am I appropriating? I'm like, that is culture. And th- that, like, that is culture. Like, tell me mm-hmm. a cult- culture that hasn't, you know, but then there is misappropriation, the taking yeah. of that, yeah. right? The taking of that, because there's a sharing, there's a sharing of it. And, and I get it. Cause there's all these things of a lot of people, especially a lot of the youth of Latinx, like being scared of reclaiming their indigeneity do they have that right and that wasn't a question when i was out you know and i was because i started this too very much in social justice and mm-hmm. um you know my earlier years being out there like we didn't cross the border the border crossed us and you know i'm indigenous like my blood is red like but now that's not the case that's not the case like moving forward because and i, and I feel that's very much a cultural um colonization that has been like very insidious in there mm-hmm. like yeah. Well, do you have that right? Do you have that right? Because then there's a disconnect with a lot of the younger folks feeling disconnected to their indigenous roots. Right. Right. Because when I was, I, I was very much involved when I was younger in, you know, the Zapatista movement, the Maya movement, because I felt connected to that and I felt connected to my indigenous roots. But a lot of folks don't even feel like, oh, can I even practice this? Is this even my right? Much less are they going to ask, are they going to get involved in the struggles of the indigenous struggles that are still you know, happening to this day. Mm-hmm. So it, it's, it's, it's something that needs to be just looked at like very um, critically, you know, um, and, and like a lot of questions need to be asked, like what, how does this, who does this benefit me being afraid of reclaiming these things? And am I claiming it, reclaiming it? Am I connecting it in a way that is with integrity and honor and respect? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, you know, I feel like that could be a whole podcast all by itself. <laughs> Like, and probably, it, I mean, I, I know people are having those conversations, but yeah, I mean, that's it. That's it. We could go deep on that subject for hours and hours, but unfortunately, Erica has time limit today. So <laughs> I want to make sure we order her time, but I would also love to talk to you for hours. <laughs> so, um, so, okay, thank you. Yeah. So before we get to kind of our game of chance question at the end, I wanted to give you an opportunity to talk about like, where people can find you if they want to know more about what your, your work that you're doing with clients and things like that. Or if you have an event coming up, and like I said, this will air the 1st of March. So kind of gives you an idea of when to talk about. So in, um, let's see, they can definitely find me at realizeyourbliss.com. And on the events I have class, I have all my events are in person and online. Mm-hmm. So you can watch it and there's a recording. So awesome. even if you can't watch it right then, you have like two weeks to watch it rewatch it if you come in person. So just, I've, I've tried to make be very accessible in that way. Um, and in March, we're going to be doing the Soul Retrieval series. 
you know, to, to reclaiming, to going into and, and understanding and connecting to those parts of ourselves of what medicine do we need to reclaim our soul pieces mm-hmm. um, from traumas and wounds and different things like that. Um, and there's two classes that I have then too. And in March, I think I'll still be doing the annual medicine class mm-hmm. and then there'll be a, a new series too. But um, realizeyourbliss.com, you can find all the events there. Yeah, and I, I highly recommend the book to people. I, 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 it was a lovely read. Like you have this great conversational tone, but the thing I really enjoyed about it, like I said, was that here are the academic pieces. Here's kind of what this looks like at practice. And here's actually a recipe how to make your own Florida water. Like it is from the academic to the everyday practical. It, it was just lovely. And it's a great recipe for Florida water. If people need one, by the way, it's not, I've seen some that are so complicated to make. It is just a really easy way to do it. So it was nice to have that. It was like, oh, this is wonderful. <laughs> so, Thank you. So our last question for everybody is a little bit of a game of chance, um, mostly because I joked that part of the reason I made a podcast was so I could talk about stuff we're not supposed to talk about. It's my Scorpio nature, I guess. <laughs> so, um, I'm going to roll a die. And depending on what number I roll, you'll get a question about death, sex, religion, politics, or money. And if I roll a six, you get to pick which one you want. And, um, you know, if you get one you don't want, you can pass because we don't really have a lot of rules. So. Two, sex. Juicy topic. All right. All right. Um, so I guess one of the things I was thinking about, like in context of the work that you do, like in, in the healing work that you do, is so many people have hangups about their bodies and sex and just, you know, being a physical person in the world. So if someone came to you and just said, hey, I just want to figure out how to have a better relationship with myself, where would you start them? Like to to kind of reclaim their sensual, physical self. So actually, I had this conversation last week with um, two women. I've had it with men too. I've had it with men as well. Um, and, it, and it was it was this one lady, uh, she purchased a Kudanitismo hybrid session. And we were talking about everything, you know, that that a lot of things that she had a lot of questions on. And one of them was um, a healing because with her ex-husband, um, she stopped enjoying sex. Mm-hmm. It was horrible. It was a horrible experience. And she just, it was 26 years of that. Oh, yeah. So there was, yeah. Uh, so there was definitely a soul loss from that. And we did some some work around that. But one of the things that I, I talked to her about, and this is actually in one of the codices too, that they talk about soul loss with and how to work, um, how that can actually happen by extending. It's it's a little bit tantric in nature, but we have it in indigenous of like how to work with orgasms to bring that energy in. Mm-hmm. So I, I I advised her, I'm like, one of her homework was, you know, get a really nice vibrator. <laughs> and one of the things that I had her do was have her inhale the orgasm to all of her energy centers. And, and actually, you know, I asked her like, what's your mantra? Like, what do you would like focus on something that you're going to be doing? Because it's bringing that energy and feeling comfortable with your sexual energy, mm-hmm. like to reclaim your sexual energy. That's a, that's a really important part of the soul loss of feeling comfortable with your sensuality and sexuality. And there was another lady, for example, that I worked with is that also had um, where she was having issues where, and this is two in the same week. It was, um, <laughs> so maybe, maybe there was, they, everything was a like, Knew that you were going to ask this question. Yeah, really? That's and they funny. wanted to give me some, some like experiences that I can talk about. One lady was, um, it, she was having, when she would think about sex or like after the, the act of it, she would actually like throw up. Oh, like wow. It was, yeah, yeah, there was like a really strong, strong revulsion. You know, she was molested. So one of the things that I, I recommended her for her to do was when she does baños, because she works a lot with water, um, is to start caressing herself. And it started out gently with like her cheeks, like to talk to her cheeks and then her arms and then to start working with her breast and start, but like slowly, you know, mm-hmm. like to be comfortable with her energy and like really start with her sensuality first and mm-hmm. then her sexuality. So I, I feel that that's, it, it's very much, it's, it's important. And I've had that conversation with men too. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's, it's, but it just so happened that I thought about these things because they, those two sessions happened last week. Mm-hmm. That's <laughs> yeah, there definitely seems to be some synchronicity. Um, 
But I think about like that, you know, even like in terms of, of people who identify as asexual, like there's still a connection to your own body, like being in your own skin has so much power in a way that I think, you know, with, you know, our culture, like our beauty culture, our youth culture, all of this stuff kind of takes that away, especially for women. But I agree with you. Like, I think men are more and more impacted by that just because there is so much visual media telling them that their bodies are wrong too, you know? So I think that that ability to have something to kind of just bring you back into yourself is so important. Yeah. Well, um, with men, I've worked with men, for example, that have like porn addictions Mm -hmm. that are, are really, you know, what is, so what is that, that, that need for primal? Mm -hmm. Cause there's this, this Dantica, this like, Oh, you know, conquer conquest thing and having them connect in different ways with their animal instinct, with the animal guide and getting primal in different kinds of expressions. Mm -hmm. That's what I, I help them do is like a shape shifting to connect with the animal. And bring that in so they don't feel like they need to feed off of it from someone else, but they can be in that energy. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's like there's mm-hmm. different expressions that I, I work with people in a lot of different kinds of ways. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's fascinating <laughs> I'm never, to me. I'm, I'm never like shy, like, oh, no, I can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I think, you know, I mean, I do think that's one thing about, you know, when you, when you do work with other people as a healer, as a, you know, counselor whatever like you know you're opening up a space for them that you have to feel comfortable in too like because you know what you don't know what people are going to bring through that door i mean i think about it even with people who just like read tarot cards like what what are they bringing to your table you know when you do that yeah and and i have a mentorship too and i and i tell people like you have to decide early on what you're not going to work with Mm -hmm. and you have to like ask yourself those questions so you can redirect that person and be a better service to yourself and to the other person. You know, like what are the things that are like not okay? Cause there are going to be some things that are not okay with us. Yeah. You know, and, and, and if we work with those things that are not okay with us, that could, that could cause injury to us. Mm-hmm. So we have to, we have to like ask ourselves, what are we okay with? What are we not okay with? And yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and if we're okay with it, we're okay with it. We roll with it. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh. Erica, thank you so much. This has been such a wonderful conversation. And like I said, I really like, um, I really, we could do this, I think for a couple more hours. Like I just really enjoyed talking with you and, and just your perspective on things. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Victor. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Witch Lit is a production of Thousand Volt Press and is edited by Julian Rashke. Our intro music is Cosmic Glow by Andrew Kay and our outro music is Voices by Alexander Shinekar. Transcripts and all our previous episodes are available at witchlitpod.com and you can follow us on Instagram and threads at witchlitpod. Please help other witches find us by leaving a rating or review wherever you listen to podcasts. Thank you for listening to and reading Witchlet.